Yo, 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 it's your boy Mark Goodman, a.k.a. the voice box of the block. I'm back with another one. I'm super, super duper excited to be here. Before I get started, let me give a shout out to all my distributors, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Breaker, Radio Public. I'm on uh, Facebook. I'm on Instagram. I'm on YouTube. I'm all over the place. I got a fantastic, fantastic episode for you today. I'm, I'm switching up a little bit. I know we t- touch on sports a lot, but I want to double back. And, and grab this 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 wonderful wonderful person. Uh, let me let me let me introduce you uh, for Fort Jackson. He's a, he's the 30, 30, 51st commanding general at Fort Jackson, which is the largest. Uh, uh, am I right? Make sure it's the largest uh, training facility in the country. Am I right? Right. right. How's it going? Uh, everything's going going well. I mean, as well as it can, you know, given COVID, and we we fought our way through COVID. Uh, like everybody else, but we, we've not been able to stop just given our mission. I mean, we literally have not stopped doing what we do, even with COVID, just like, you know, soldiers are going to do. We're going to fight through the enemy, uh, enemy being COVID, and, and kind of work our way to keep producing soldiers. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that. Do I asked all my uh, my, my guests you know, as far as with the pandemic, how's your health, how's your family? Because you got to ask that nowadays, man, because so many people are getting sick and things of that nature. I always want to make sure I ask, how's your family? Everybody okay? Yeah, everybody's fine. My, my oldest son, is he's in the Army too, so he's down at uh, Fort Benning, Georgia. My youngest, he's here. He goes to South Carolina State, but, of course, they're doing virtual work. And then the wife, you know, she's a South Carolina girl too, not from the, from the upstate. I picked from the low state. Uh, which which is all good and, yes. and we're we're fine. We, we had both both vaccines and you know didn't have any you know major reactions after it and and or really you know feeling a lot better uh, just given the fact we've had both you know doses of the vaccine already. All right, that's that's great. That's great. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna jump right into it because we're not gonna waste our time because I think this is a super 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 dope podcast I got going on. We're gonna we're gonna talk about legacy. We're gonna talk about generation. A hundred years. A hundred years of service, and we're gonna start back. We, let's let's take them back a little bit, General. General, let's talk them back to your great grandfather. Let's let's talk about the time he he stepped on on that Fort Jackson campus. Yeah. So my my great great grandfather Walter Beagle, and he you know he is somebody that I knew. A lot of people don't know their great great grandparents and get right. to know them, but I literally you know spent time you know at his house, spent the night as a kid. And growing up as a kid, I mean, I thought he was white. I mean, the first time I, you know, could recognize and realize race and those type things, you know, my dad takes me over and he's like, this is your, your great grandpa. I'm like, no, he's not. He doesn't look like me. <laughs> you know, he was, you know, back in the day term, you know, mulatto because yeah. he, he was mixed. And, you know, he was very, very light. You know, hair, right. uh, just as straight, those type of things. But but I soon realized, yeah, this is this is blood relative and, you know, kind of saw through that. And But he never talked about, you know, his service. I really didn't, didn't know about it, but, you know, I didn't, I didn't know uh, how much, you know, he would mean to me later on in life. And the fact that, you know, he stepped foot on Fort Jackson or Camp Jackson back then in 1918, he, he never talked about it, family a little bit here and there. And, you know, he passed away when I was 15 years old. So, I mean, I, literally my great, great grandfather was around that long. And so all those interactions, uh, were just great to have. But when he came to Camp Jackson, you know, there was a lot of things that he couldn't do. I mean, for a black male, even as light as he looked, he could have passed as the term is used. You know, you could pass, but he couldn't pass back then. I mean, yeah, right, already on the right. card, you know, mulatto or black, he's not going to pass. And so, you know, he couldn't fight in combat units and, and, and nor any of his peers could do that. And they weren't going to necessarily deploy him into combat, but he did. He went to France uh, eventually. And just a lot of barriers, you know, back in the day. Somebody asked me yesterday, could I get my mind around what he went through then? I said, no, I, I actually couldn't. Uh, when you're segregated, you know, uh, have the same quality of food, living conditions, those type of things is, is, your, is your counterparts and just because of the, the color of your skin. Right, right, right. And I want to touch bases on that, kind of give people a, a visual of, of of what was going on back then during those segregated times. And a lot of the things that was happening in 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 civil in the civil times was basically happening in the military. The same treatment of blacks and soldiers. Am I correct? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. And it's because I mean we're we're a cut of our society. So everybody that comes into the military, they're coming from society. So they're coming in with their biases, with their views, with their perspectives on thing, things that even though the army, even back then, you know, was trying to, you know, make 
for you know equality in a sense. I mean, we, we, we continue to do that now and do it much better. You still have those people that came in. They're coming from the deep south and everywhere else. And those views, they grew up with them. They, you know, based on their upbringing and everything else. So even though they're in an institution and in a system that's trying to make things fair, it's, it's the same, it's no different today. You still have those people that come in and you have to inculcate them, you know, with army values and they were one team and you know, those type of things. But but it takes time. Back then, everybody was the same mindset. It was just black and white, literally. And you know, again, we can leverage you but it was more so for labor. I mean, for as a black male, that's all they wanted, uh, you know, wanted, you know, as for was, was labor, even as a soldier, the, the unit that he and the blacks were assigned to was called a labor battalion. Right, that's what I wanted to get into like. You're, you're, you're you, gonna do labor. Can you discuss some of the things, I think I was reading, they loaded ships, that's a great, great friend, grandfather did, I think they loaded ships, and some of the other things, could you kind of name some of the things that they was, that was they assigned to do? Yeah, so just a lot, a lot of manual labor. So I mean, like you said, load ships when they were getting ready to deploy. I mean, building rail lines, setting up tents. I mean, so they would have to set up tents, you know, for white soldiers and others. And their tents were like, you know, things that were you know brought out of trash cans and they were wow. you know outdated and dilapidated. That's what they lived in. And you're living, you know, separate. There are even trenches, you know, for training. You know, so soldiers that were going to 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 Europe to fight the war. You know, they train, you know, trenches, those type things. Well, the labor battalion, those soldiers, my great grandfather dug those trenches. And some of those in certain spots on Fort Jackson right now, I, I, I know exactly where they are. So I mean, it's kind of amazing wow. to, to wow. ride by and look and go, hey, there's there's an old <laughs> trench line. Wow. Well, great grandpa might have been out there digging. Right. Things, exactly. You know, exactly. More than likely. But that's that's what they did. Anything that dealt with labor, that's what they were going to do. But they weren't right. going to fight because we weren't, you know, capable. And that was the mindset back then. We weren't capable. We didn't have the. The mental capacity, you know, to, to fight, you know, uh, as a black, as an African American. Now, knowing this information about your great great grandfather, did that inspire you to get into service, or you always wanted to get into service? I, I always did, and like I said, I, you know, I had some other you know cousins and uncles and you know and folks just right there in Ree that you know that had served and and always kind of admired those guys. I mean, you know, it looked it kind of felt to me like you know they passed. A test, you know, and knowing a right. little bit of you know black history in the military, just kind of growing up. But it was one thing that I knew I wanted to do was just that service, and then kind of growing up, you know, and, and, and with my my schoolmates in, in Woodruff, you know, it's that team that team bond that we had. I mean, I played all three sports, and you know, I don't know if you know some of the names from my day, but Tony Rice and all those guys, hey, listen, and Coach Barner. Why? Well, well, I just had Tony Rice on uh, a couple of weeks ago. I just had him on. Oh. And I'm, I'm telling you, I had so much fun with Tony Rice. He took me down, yeah. saying, I can't wait to Tony Rice see this because he actually follows me and uh, he, he enjoys what I'm doing, man. So I'm so glad you had, you said you went to school with Tony Rice because Tony yeah, Rice, like, yeah. you, you, and you know, I, I know Tony Rice is like the man around here. Yeah, I, I can get four stars, and I can never surpass Tony Rice. So I mean, <laughs> I'm not even trying. I'm not, I just know that I'm not even trying. So you, you play, made, you, you play, so you play football in Woodrow? Yeah, yeah. So graduated there. We we played, you know, from Pee Wee League, you know, Pop Warner, all the way up. And Tony wow. got wow. separated from us in the ninth grade. So he went from ninth grade to varsity. And we all <laughs> stayed back. We went to the game on Friday night to watch Tony. Right. And we'd only we weren't rooting for the team. We were rooting for Tony. <laughs> he, he, to lose yeah. he was our classmate, you know, as yeah. ninth graders. And then finally, we all catch up, you know, to him at varsity. And and you know the deal. I mean, just all those undefeated seasons you know, everything else, but, you know, but basketball, track, you know, we, we did all those sports, you know, wow. together. I didn't know. Rodney, I did Rodney know. Rice was in there. Oh, I yeah. I didn't know. Oh, That's yeah. crazy. That is crazy. That is crazy. That is crazy. <laughs> so you remember a lot of, you you remember a lot of the winning days in the, in the Woodruff. You was at that era. You you was that oh, era. Yeah. Oh, yeah. On the on the back of our records, it had zero on a lot of them. <laughs> you know, I mean, you name it. A lot of, a lot of zeros on the back of our records. I mean, um, you know, basketball track, you know, there, because, I mean, all those guys, I mean, and that's how they kept us, you know, conditioned and in shape. And we, we all played football, basketball, track together. Some guys, you know, kind of like Rodney Rice played baseball. Yeah. But, but we, we were in condition, like, the entire year. So when it came to any sport, we, we never stopped. I mean, you just roll from one to the other. In some cases, you're playing both kind of a little bit simultaneous. And then even in track, I mean, we had a couple of state championships, you know, in track. <laughs> And I, and, I, and I always said that, and that's the reason why I had Tony Rice on, because me growing up in Woodruff, 
I never hear about a lot of these things because they don't highlight or really, or really, or really m- remember a lot of the, the accomplishment. Not only Tony Rice, but you and and a lot of others have accomplished it at that stadium, man. And that's why I like to bring y'all on to kind of talk about some of these things because we wouldn't know. Yeah, yeah. But I think the high school does a really good job, though. If you go in and look at, like, the Hall of Fame, because, I mean, yes. like, I'm in the track, track Hall of Fame. I'm really yes. proud of that. So, yeah, okay. Tony probably wouldn't tell you, but I was faster than him. So, oh. you know, <laughs> yeah, he, 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 he can challenge me on that one. But, uh, <laughs> but we, did, we did race, you know, after after high school. Right. Day, but he, he was still he, – he was, he was a fast man. He was, he was. But, but at, least, at least, you know, I'm just proud to be there. And I know Tony, of course, easy – Easy money being in the Hall of Fame for football. <laughs> yeah. We probably should be there for track, you know, as well. Really? But yeah. yeah got it. Got it. I had told him uh, when he was on, I think earlier last year, late last year, Woodrow inducted him into the Hall of Fame in basketball. Yeah. So, like okay. I said, he should he should be in the Hall of Fame for track too as well, like you said. Yeah. He'll probably get, he'll probably get all three. And he, and he was a shot putter, believe it or not. I mean, you know, yeah. I mean, he ran so <laughs> like, I did not. Know, I did not know that. Yeah, he ran. He ran some of the sprints, and then again, because they were intermixes until they got the mix right. But uh, you know, it was me, Jeff Duncan, uh, James McKissick beat. I don't know if you know him. Uh, we we're all on the four by you know four hundred team. Tony was he started there a little bit on the four by one. But yeah, Tony shot put. I mean, with that football arm, he could throw the ball out of the stadium. Stadium right. you know, from Woodruff and Reed probably. <laughs> so if so you think about it now, it makes sense. Yeah, he was he was a shot putter too. Yeah, so so um I don't want to harp on too much of that because I want to I want people to I want people to make sure they round the bases on this story because it's an amazing story. So you get into the service and I and I um I read something you had said in the arc. You said it's important to know where your ceiling at so you can break through it. So when you right. got into the service, did you did you know you wanted to become a, a general or you you was just okay? Let me see where I get in. I fit in. I know my history. What what was your what was your thinking? Yeah, so coming in, I mean, you, you just you want to survive. You want to get in any environment and just survive first. Can, can I survive this? Can I make it? And you're not really thinking about that ceiling yet. But once you figure out, yep, okay, I, I can swim. I, I can I can swim in these waters. I can swim in the deep end of the pool. And, and now I want to thrive in this environment. And then you set your goals. But knowing somebody's always going to put that ceiling above your head. I mean, I had that coming out of high school, you know, just right there in Woodruff. I mean, sitting down, I won't say the name, but, you know, um, a guidance counselor said, hey, you know, my grades weren't bad. Like I told you, playing three sports. I said, I want to go to college. And she looked at me and said, well, well, maybe you should do, you know, something technical. You know, go drive a truck or something like that, whatever. Wow. So, oh, okay, tracking. I, I got you. So that's what I mean by the ceiling. So that clearly, for me, was the ceiling at that point. And now you got to break it. And so I tell young kids, anytime you look up and that ceiling is above you, you got to imagine that it's glass. And your, your wow. job, your task is to break that ceiling. And so even coming in the army, you see some, some of those barriers I experienced, you know, coming in, you know, not anything I, I think that drastic people would do some things to you covertly. I mean, you, you got to uh, exceed the standard to, to excel. Right. Uh, whereas, and that gets you a level playing field. I mean, we always talk about, uh, you, you know, if you look different, if your gender is a little bit different, then you kind of got, you know, a couple of strikes on you. So you, you got to use that last pitch, you know, and knock it out of the park. Right. And that's kind of, you know, your focus. And so every pitch thrown, I'm trying to knock it out of the park because you just got to be a little bit better, you know, than the average bear. And and so once I knew I could break those ceilings and keep breaking them, then it's like, okay, then the sky's the limit. And we, we call the army a meritocracy. You go as far as you want based on your own merit, which is absolutely true. So you put in the work, you know, and you, you do the work, you, you go as far as you want to go. But ain't that, ain't, you can kind of, you kind of relate that to life in general, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. It's just putting it whatever whatever work you put in is going to reflect eventually. You know, yes. and I think and I think yeah. that's that's a good word. I got I got to keep that in mind. But move but, but moving forward, you did you know uh you done your service. I see you did a lot of time, you know, you went to uh you went to Iraq a few times, a lot of tours, and uh now you're back. Now you the you you get to the Fort Jackson 50 frog. I want to get to this because at first your great great grandfather they looked at him as he couldn't do something. And now you're training and commanding. So, so how did that? Is that a surreal feeling for you? Like you look back at my great great grandfather, they looked at him like he couldn't do something, and you commanded and training men and female and women as to be leaders and soldiers. Yeah. 
Ain't it yeah, like a yeah. surreal moment for you? Like you sit back and like, wow, you know what I mean? Over over these years, yeah. you know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. No, it's 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 pretty surreal. But but I literally had to start you know, answering that question because people would ask that and like, <laughs> hey, isn't that, isn't that ironic? You know, you hear your grandfather came, right? And, this you is know, everything you just mentioned, <laughs> right? And so what I would tell them, I said, well, it's it's not ironic. It's progress, right? Mm. And that just goes to show you. You know, we stand on the shoulders of, of people, you know, regardless of what we do, but we were always standing on somebody's shoulders. And so that's just progress. I mean, I didn't know I was standing on his shoulders, and I don't think he knew as much as what was going to happen, you know, in him and a lot of others, you know, after they, they did their, their part. And for them, what they really wanted to prove was, hey, we, we can do more than just labor. And, and that was a key thing for a black man back then was, hey, we can fight too, we can lead. I mean, that's what they were fighting for. Granted, they didn't get it, you know, in all cases, but but that's the seed that they plant. And so look look at the crop that is produced, which is me. Uh, that's progress. Right, right, right. And, I, and it was interesting through your generation of your last name. They took the S off. I want. I was just wondering, curious, why did why did I think your grandfather did that? Right. Yeah, why did he yeah. take the S off? Yeah. This this will. Fun. Now, this is a guess for me as well, but here, here's my, my, my best assumption on it, because my grandfather could not read or write, and, and mm -hmm. I didn't know that until, you know, I learned to read and write, and so we're out trying to read something. I'd spend a lot of time with him, too, you know, weekends and, and summers, and then I, I realized, you know, he got a check one day, and he said, you know, show me the check and, you know, how much he made, and then he turned it over to sign it, and then I looked at it, and I'm like, Grandpa, you put an X on it, and then, and, you know, I asked my grandma, she's like, yeah, he can't read or write. Wow. Really? Okay, so what my assumption is, is at some point in time, somebody wrote the name down and just probably left the S off, Beagle. I mean, it's just like the Beagle. like the dog, and they leave the S off. He doesn't know any better, doesn't bother to change it. Um, I don't think my grandmother bothered to change it. Uh, and I know this to be true because my first name should be Milton. And because I asked my grandma, I said, why? I never asked about the last name. I said, why is my first name Milford? Why, why, why on earth would you make my first name Milford? And, of course, that's my dad's name, too, because I'm a junior. And she said, well, it's supposed to be Milton. I said, well, what, what happened? And she said, in the hospital, they brought me down, you know, your, your dad birth certificate, and it said Milford. And I'm like, okay, I'm good with it. And she left it at that. <laughs> so I'm assuming the same thing happened with the last name. Because you, you figure at that time, I mean, people I guess gonna, they did. not going to make a big issue. I guess at that time, they didn't put too much emphasis on the name. Right. On, on the name or making an issue of it. I mean, you know, I mean, you think about, you know, some of the interactions they could have had, you I mean, whether it be a white merchant or whatever, here's, you know, your name, they signed something. I'm not, okay, I'm not going to make a big deal of that. Just leave it as is. But there's another part of my family that lives up up there, you know, Lawrence, Aura, in that area, and they keep the S on. And so there's always this internal family thing of like, <laughs> your, your last name's spelled wrong. No, it's not. Yours is. So, and these are like my first and second cousins. Right, right, right. Right, 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 right. Back, right, right, right. back, back and forth. So, yeah, so the S is not coming back because, you know, I, I stick with my story. I'm going to stick to it. But everybody on, you know, my grandfather's side, my uncles, that whole side of our family, there's no S. And there's a couple of others wow. the same way. But like I said, his brothers that kept the S, like their siblings and you know, kids, they all have the S on the end of their name. Wow. So that could be a, a tad bit confusing in, at, at, at the family reunion. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. You, you know how I go. After that, it might, might come to blows or something. But, yeah. So, so I want to I want to I want to talk, talk about the 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 anxiety. I think you you talked about. I was reading while well, I was watching a uh, a video of you in a in a mini in a mini, and you was talking about uh, the mini uh, car you was riding with somebody, and you was talking about the details of some of your uh, trainees that come in with a lot of anxiety, maybe with depression. When they see they walk in and they they shook. You don't know they got attitudes. How do you how do you determine? Oh, this. She's gonna be a soldier. Or, or he's he's gonna be. How do you kind of determine? Or you can't determine. It's, it, you gotta you gotta wait. Yeah, you, you can you can determine. It was the Mini Cooper ride with uh, the the former USC president, yes, President yes, Castillo. Yes, that, yes. that was the coolest thing. You that was great to too. That, I want to say that was great. I wish oh, I could do that with you. You know what I mean? Towards the end when you was coming down the thing, that was that was crazy. Yes. <laughs> but cool. I mean, totally totally awesome. But um. <laughs> You can tell when they come in. I mean, it's just like, you know, a football, you know, field or basketball court, whatever. If you stand back there, you know, kind of like a coach and just watch. I mean, you'll, you'll see who's who, who's not quite cutting it, who's out of breath. I mean, those kind of things. 
we can tell when they get off the bus. I mean, even me, I'm not, you know, drill sergeant, but I've seen it, been in it, you know, for so long. You can go there and watch them get off the bus. And some are coming off the bus, they're crying already. You're like, yeah, you're going to have some problems. <laughs> You know, some are coming off and they're, they're like, you can tell they're, they're ready to go. And and those are the ones, it's, it's like the, I hate to say weak ones, it's the ones that, you know, are not quite there yet. And those are the ones you got to focus on, not, you know, just kind of, you know, jump on them, but you got to focus on them to, because, you know, they're, they're, they're not as, as strong at this point for whatever reason. And you find a lot of reasons, things that they bring from home, you name it, different anxieties like you talked about. And, and try to help them. You got to get them over the fence of like, okay, you're willing to come here. You came here for a reason. Now we just got to get you to a point where, you know, you're good, you know, in your mind, we you start build that resiliency, your mental toughness, and you go from there. But that's just like a kid that comes to, you know, football practice, they get hit in the mouth the first time. It's like, okay, I'm done. Well, well, <laughs> okay, that's going to happen. I mean, that's going to kind of happen, you know, so you got to work them through that. And then, and then they're good. But I mean, we have very low rate. Uh, that we lose that, you know, come in probably about 5%. But right now we're at about 3%, which is good. And that's bringing in a thousand a week. So right. you figure out of a thousand. I, I, we're, I, we're only... I read, I read, y'all bring in a lot. I think you, I think it was 50% male and 6% females. Yeah. For and that, and that, and that is a lot. That is, yes. that is, that is a lot. And that's massive. And I think, and I yeah. think that's, a, and I think you do a wonderful, y'all do a wonderful job at that facility. I salute y'all, man. Y'all, Y'all do a wonderful job, and and I I I didn't know you wrote a book. I want to talk yeah. about the book, The Rock, because I want to talk about you because this is why because you were an inspiring leader, a strategic planner, a team builder, and an author. We can't leave the author part out. So talk, I want you to talk about your book because because I I didn't know you wrote a book until the end because I was researching you for the last couple of weeks, and then when I saw the video, I said, oh, he got a book out. So I started reading the book. I'm at the early stages of it. I got, I got, um, I got it pulled up. But I want you to talk about your book. Is that rock? You, 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 you. I, I like when you said you said uh, any organization has to have a rock. And I want you yeah. to just talk about why you wrote the book. What inspired you to write the book? Because I know you was talking about a lot of people was encouraging you to write the book. So just talk about that book a little. bit. Yeah, so the, the rock is a metaphor for like a platform. So I mean every organization needs something for that leader to have a you know a platform to speak to speak from, you know, to speak to the people and and be with them. And I was encouraged to write it because I mean I, I inherited a unit that was, you know, just not not doing so well. I mean, in, in a lot of different ways. I'm like, you know, at that point, you know, you're you're trying to motivate yourself because you gotta stay inspired and motivated every day to motivate this entire organization. That organization happened to be you know, like 1,200 soldiers of all different walks in life, attitudes, you name it. And there are divides in that and, and all those type of things. And so just by me, literally, and that's where the title came from, was The Rock. Because, I mean, I went out, you know, first time and, like, spoke to him, but I couldn't see everybody. Because, I mean, you're, like, you know, eye level with, with a formation of 1,200. Just imagine. Yeah. <laughs> you can't see everybody eye, eyeball to eyeball. And, like, you yeah. know, being a good country boy I am, and, like, you know, <laughs> the, the old man that tells you, you got to look man in the eye, woman in the eye, and, like, talk to him. I said, I, I, need, I need something to get up to elevate. And so I came back the following week and there was this big rock. I mean, literally, I don't know how they got there. It, it had a fork lift or something, but I still- Almost like, 200 pounds, like, almost 200 pounds. Yeah. <laughs> right, you know, and I could see everybody. And then the, and from that rock, just, you know, talk to them every week. And it was, you know, more, almost a mix of like pep rally kind of stuff, motivating kind of thing wow. that, you know, I didn't intend to do. After I did the first one, I'm walking away, you know, everybody's kind of fired up, pumped up. And a soldier comes up to me, he's like, sir, that's pretty good. So what are you going to do next week? <laughs> hey, I wasn't planning on doing nothing next week. That was kind of it. <laughs> you know, so I had to keep doing it. But it was it was causing, you know, that growth, causing that connection across the formation. And, and we absolutely achieved, like, phenomenal stuff. And that's why they all came back. I mean, a lot of soldiers to this day still send me notes, everything else. I mean, just like I'm, I'm still, like, their boss. And th this has been, you know, 2008. In 2010 window, but I get notes and letters and all that kind of stuff from them all the time because it was just so amazing what we accomplished. And that was just the power of me standing on the rock talking, but really the power of them believing, you know, and, and me leveraging my influence over them and, and them just having faith and trust in each other to get a lot of stuff done. And if we'd have been a football team, we'd have been 12-0, no doubt about it. There, there's no... No doubt about it. Uh, you know, it was it was just that powerful, and that's what amazed them. You know, just with that bond that we had. And I and I think and I think we can again. I always 
take a lot of the tips that I, I hear and when I was reading, a lot of us to imply in my own life. And I think we need to apply it in, 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 in life too. Like having the rock, having somebody, a platform where we can talk about these things, discuss things in a positive manner. I think this podcast is my rock. Exactly. And I, I was going to say, if you didn't say it, I was going to say it for you. That, that's you. You got a rock right now. That's it. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, 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 and and a lot of times, me, I like I like the diet. Uh, not only uh, a physical diet, but a mental diet of what I hear, read. Yeah. So sometimes you have to create your own platform. So a yeah. lot of times, it's important for me to do things like this to talk to you to inspire myself. Because you don't know how, how much it is when I read your story to be able to change the perception of something. You change the perception of, you know, Black soldiers in Fort Jackson, your tradition, your family tradition. I want to make sure people understand that from, from, from coming in to your great, great grandfather coming in, not being looked at as a soldier and only a laborer to you being a leader and a soldier of many men. I think that's tremendous. And I think people need to talk about it. And I want to make sure that my rock is an open court for men like yourself to talk about stuff like that. Yeah, no, you're, you're you're spot on and perfect. And what you're doing, I mean, I applaud it. It's great. And I mean, and I and I, I hate to throw this at you, but it but it's great. And me growing up, you know, in Enery, I remember your grandfather extremely well. And yes. not only him, but you know, because he lived like four or five houses up the street from me. And so you know, walking out whether we were sneaking to the store or sneaking to the swimming pool, you, know, <laughs> you go by, you go by Mr. Israel's house, and and, and all those guys hung out. You know, under the tree. I don't know if you know where the tree yeah, is. Yeah, I know the tree. I know right, the right, <laughs> yeah, right as you cross the railroad tracks, uh, and all of them are going to be there. But, you know, every one of those guys, I mean, they always had, you know, something positive to say, something nice to say, you know, to us as kids growing up. And, and you don't see that as much today. And, and they would take the time to talk to you. You know, you stand there. I could, if it was only, you know, your grandpa under the tree, and I, I'm coming by, you know, he tagged me down, hey, how you doing? He's going to speak. We're going to talk, wow. Wow. communicate, whatever, and then continue to go. But, you know, it was just that generation, you know, of men, you know, black men, then that it was just so powerful. And I, and I even wrote about it in my book. You know, I, I told, you know, tell the story about my dad. And he would say, you treat everybody, you know, with dignity and respect. And you think about that tree. And I remember being a teenager. He said, you never underestimate where some of these guys come from or what they can do. And, and it was absolutely true. I mean, if I had an issue with my car, I'd go to the tree. Somebody on there was a mechanic or they knew how to fix a car. Absolutely. You know? and, and they weren't going to charge anything for it, like your own son. Hey, what's wrong with it? Let me look at it. Let me check it out. And, you know, there are four or five of them trying to figure it out and, and free of charge. And so that was stuff, you know, that you, you grew to understand, you know, paying it for. Hey, do that for somebody else. You're good because they, they did it for us. And just a great, you know, group of guys. I mean, always, I just remember them all always smiling. Your granddad, I mean, especially. I mean, never saw those guys like mad and <laughs> They, they argue about stuff like people do, but just, you know, they always had a smile on their face, no matter what, you know, no money, whatever, just, just hanging out, but they're always smiling. Wow. Wow. So, so now like on um, when you do, I know you're a busy man, but I always be wondering what are you a busy man? Like you're doing your downtime. You know, you got a wife and you got kids. It's on your downtime. Relax. What, what are you doing? Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> I live for a nap, man. I, I'm telling you, I, I live for nap time. It's like a two-year-old give me a blanket, they put me in a corner. I'm, I'm gone, gone. I'm down. Yeah. So yeah. Well, listen, but, I, I I know I, you said I only have thirty minutes, but I have to leave at least four or five minutes for my for my rock to be your platform to tell somebody youth. That's just looking at this, that's this, 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 this not quite motivated or maybe motivated, but has some doubt, has some anxiety, things that you probably already seen a young man have, young female have. What are some of the things you can tell them to uplift their fears and stay focused and look at that ceiling and break through? Yeah, so the first thing is, you know, you, and I said this yesterday, you, you can't dream what you can't see. Oh. And for our generation now, I mean, there is a lot they can see. I mean, we've had you know, a black president, we've got a black, you know, uh, woman, you know, vice president right now. I mean, all these things they can see, head coaches, you name it. It may not be in the numbers everybody likes and, and, and folks will focus on the, the negative aspects of all those things. Well, it's not enough, whatever. Well, at least they're there. They're at the table, you know, type of thing. I mean, you got generals. I mean, maybe not what everybody desires, but, but it's there. And then, you know, for me, I'm just proud of giving my hometown. Most people, even in South Carolina, 
You know, they don't think about Henry or Woodruff. I mean, they know Clinton, they know Spartanburg. Everything in the middle is like, it doesn't exist. And so, you know, to come from there and say, yeah, I came from a very, very small town, you know, and, and it proves a point. You know, you can break through any ceiling that's put above you. Granted, you got to put in the work. Nobody's going to give you anything and, and you can go wherever you want to go. Uh, but they got to know whatever they want to be is out there, right? Just they got to focus on it. They can dream it because it's there. Uh, whatever it is, they've got to put in the work and never be outworked. I mean, that's the other key thing that I've learned. I mean, like you're sitting where you're sitting because you outwork somebody. Somebody right now is just talking about doing what you're doing. And that's all they're doing. You know, and, and we all know the worth of, of talk. I mean, it's, it's just talk. The same thing with excuses. You can throw excuses all day long, but I mean, excuses are going to get you nowhere. In, in army terms, we say the effective range of an excuse is zero meters. Ooh. I mean, that, that's going nowhere. Right? It's, it's, you know, not going to do any do you any good. And you know, but put the excuses aside. Aside, you know, whatever it is they want to do, they they have to work at it. You know, and and success. There's no easy button. You know, it doesn't it doesn't come free. The thing it costs you is your time. And you know, give up that time for something that you want. When you get there, it's really worth it. Then all you're doing at that point is giving it back. You're, you're pulling somebody else because somebody's always looking at you uh, to see what they can be. Somebody's watching you all the time going, I'm, I'm going to see you and I'm going to be better than you because I want to yeah. do what you're doing. Exactly. Right? Even, exactly. even with some of those out there watching your podcast. And, and that's what it's about. I mean, that should inspire you every day because somebody's watching, right? And somebody's working also right now to be better than you because they're, they're just putting in that work, right? And, and that's good. That's something to applaud them. Four. So I just hope there, there are those out there that, you know, whether they're thinking about the military or something else, that they have that desire to put in the work, prove somebody wrong. And that one, that same counselor that said, hey, you shouldn't go to college. You won't, you won't ever make it in college. You know, she calls me to this day to come back to Woodruff to, to speak at things, to do whatever. And I never made mention of it. It, it does me no good to like rub that in her eye. Look, look at me now. Wow. It does me no good. She inspired the hell out of me, to be quite honest with you. By her telling me that, it's like, thank you. You just set the fuse. Yeah. Right there. You just lit but, it. But you just lit it. Right? <laughs> so I, mean, really, I, I really would thank her for, for doing that. But I never thanked her because then she'd say why. And I don't want to say why, but but I do tell her thank you quite a bit. <laughs> but, but most young people, when that happens to them, they crumble. It's like you can't go down. I mean, you get in that ring and you start swinging. But and you may go down for a minute. You may go to a knee, but you get up and you keep swinging. And you've got to do that every single day. And that, that's what makes it worth it. Man, wow, wow. Listen, thank you. And before I let you go, you know I gotta can't go without saying something back home to the NRE South Carolina. You got to talk to your people. What Do you, you want to say anything to your people back home? Because I know you're a busy man. And uh, do you want to say anything to your people back home? I know you got a lot of cousins. My mama going to say, make sure he, he takes out the South to get in the line. <laughs> you got anything you want to say to your people back home? Yeah, no, I, I'll shout out, you know, Enery and Woodruff. I mean, both. I mean, because I wouldn't, I wouldn't be here without both or the people, you know, of both. And, and right there on the line, that, that community, you know, that we had there, like I said, from your, your grandfather all the way back to, you know, his mom, you know, Miss Miss Lily, you know, live right behind us. And we would yes, go come on. buy popsicles or whatever from Miss Lily <laughs> for a dime you know, every time we can get a dime. Right. And, you know, just that kindness growing up in that environment. Uh, it's got me truly to where I am because that's right. how everybody treated everybody. Dignity, respect, you know, always a kind word, those type of things. So I thank everybody in, in, in NRE for, you know, producing me because everybody had their thumbprint in me. And then in Woodruff, just all the family and friends that, you know, I gained there uh, because that's, you know, like your second home, kind of a joined in line. But but I'm, I'm proud to be from there. I know everybody's proud of me, you know, being from there. And, you know, like I've always said to many people, I won't let them down. Uh, because, you know, people look up to you and they're proud of you for what you do. So that's always a, a goal in the back of my mind is not to not to let it down, not to disappoint. That's what drives me. There it is. There it is. Man, I want to thank you. Thank you to 51st Fort Jackson Commander General Beagles. I want to thank you for coming on, taking your time. We love you. I'm trying to give you your flowers early. Thank you. I appreciate it. It's your boy, Mark Goodman, a.k.a. the voice box of the block. And we out. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Marcus.